The Big Footy Port LA podcast is proudly sponsored by New Vision. My team, Kanda, power. I love the power. power, power. I love the power. power, power. Welcome to Port Fan Radio, and this is the Big Footy podcast where it's craziness tonight. And Rick has actually taken over control of the station and absolved Macker of his hosting abilities. So tonight we have fisting Rick in the chair, and I'm joined by his royal baldness, Lord Macker. <laughs> very bold, very happy to be here, buddy. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. And have you relaxed from the weekend? Just. My heart rate has gone down, finally. At about uh, four thirty this afternoon, and everything's back to normal. It's good. Yes, I couldn't believe halfway through the last you texted me going, "Oh my god, I hate showdowns. This is just craziness." It's horrendous. I hate them. They're horrible. You hate them? I love them when we and, win, but only after the fact. And what do you hate so much about them? I hate the the stress level that I go under watching them because they're just too stressful. I actually turned off about 10 minutes of the last quarter because I couldn't watch it. That is shameful. You I should went, be I ashamed. I went and bathed my children instead. <laughs> we should maybe strip your title of being a dedicated port supporter if you can't actually watch uh, the TV. And uh, and we've got a guest with us. Uh, Jacob Surgeon from Port Adelaide has come on in for the night. <laughs> Jacob, how are you? Uh, uh, yeah, not too bad, not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> what show is that, you? I, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna. They're gonna expect that I know a lot more than I know about football. If you uh, <laughs> as a coach, guys, right to me. I thought it was actually Jacob Surgeon, but it's El Scorcho <laughs> from. How are you? Mate? Very good, very good. Uh, also, like Macca, I, I hate showdowns. I always feel like we're gonna lose. But uh, unlike him, I was not able to turn the TV off because I attended the game. Um, and yeah, I was very happy to to see us comfortably or win pretty comfortably in the end. See, if I go to the game, that's all right, but watching it on TV, you can't yell, you can't do anything. It's a different story. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Different story when you're there. So it was, it was good to be there in, in, amid, in amongst all the Crows fans and, and to get over the line pretty comfortably. Love it. Excuses, excuses. So um, <laughs> we've got, is someone watching the Twitter feed tonight? Yeah. Yeah? Yep. Okay, so we're looking for people to tweet us in again. We're looking people, for people to Facebook in. We're going to have our uh, Who Am I? That's stumping everybody at this point in time. So we'll get that going as well. And um, and don't forget, we also got up for grabs um, the two tickets for the Richmond game for everyone who subscribes to the mailing list. And um, and you can join Macca and I binging on food and drink while we watch... Uh, our mighty power players uh, pummel Richmond, so uh, get on board with that as well. And and just quickly before we get into everything, uh, let's uh, let's have a quick apology for uh, the AFL review show last night. For anyone that was tuning in, uh, we had a bit of a technical issue, which has flowed over to Macca's computer tonight, and that's why uh, I've taken over the the hosting console. Much to Macca's disgust, I never realised Macca's actually as much of a control freak until this point in time. You controlling bugger, Macca. I'm, I'm still concerned about where this is going to go, but it's all right. <laughs> We're all right. I have I'll... some trust in, in you here. It's good. We should. I'll try and even not squeak the chair as much as possible. <laughs> so I'm sort of waffling on now. So uh, shall we uh, get into the love and the hates? Yes. Let's yes. do it. Who wants to go first? Jacob. All right. I'm happy to. Yeah. What would you like me to start with? Love or hate? Love. Okay. Love. I'm going to go with Ryder. Uh, and just the new Ford structure having the extra toll. Um, you, we're just starting to see some glimpses, especially uh, against a couple of teams uh, in Hawthorne when they had late get injured and the Crows, who have only one tall defender, um, just how dangerous he can be. Um, obviously, neither Schultz nor Westhoff you'd call a big-bodied Ford. Uh, they're both quite good at what they do, but just right as the kind of leading forward where he's, he's a freight train when he gets on the lead. And you can just see that even if they, you know, teams park a, a Ruckman uh, in the middle of the 50, he's still going to be able to run through them and take marks. And what that's going to do to our forward entries is really exciting going forward. And we've already had a bit of a taste of it. So I'm really excited about how that how that's going to happen going forward. That's probably my love. That's a good call. I love that call. It is a good call. 
I mean, how exciting is Ryder at the moment? He's really coming into his own in the last two games, isn't he? He has. Yeah. This is what we got him for, and he's uh, he's delivering at the moment. It's great. Absolutely. Yeah. And he was, it was a testament to um, the saying of tall men don't get any smaller as the game goes on because his influence really came into it in that last quarter, in the, especially in the forward uh, section of the ground for us. Absolutely. And uh, look, I think Loby sometimes has an issue holding his contested marks. He, he always competes well, but he probably doesn't clunk as many as you'd like from someone for his size. But Ryder seems to really hold those marks. Um, you know, I've, I've noticed that when he was playing for Essendon and definitely for us, you know, he might have two players hanging off him, but he manages to clunk some of those big marks, which is really important in tight games. Well, you'd almost... Macca's been... That's been one of Macca's uh, hobby horses uh, uh, throughout Lobie's career, is uh, his lack of uh, contested marking, Macca? Uh, lack of any sort of marking, not just contested. Yeah, I, I agree. <clears throat> but, look, hopefully yeah. he can improve. I mean, there was another sort of five or six times on the weekend where we kicked to him and he probably should have marked, but... Just couldn't uh, couldn't get the mitts on the bowl, but you know it'll it'll happen. Hopefully, in a grand final, he's going to take fifteen marks and you know eight contested marks and kick five goals or something. That'd be nice. It would be lovely. Definitely make a difference. <laughs> Indeed. Awesome. And what was your hate? My hate. It's it's quite difficult to, to find too much to hate after the, uh, after the weekend. So I've gone a bit outside the square, and my hate is the Western Bulldogs. Uh, and the reason is that oh, yeah. our dub. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I love watching him play, but our double this ups this year, with the uh, with the new system where they split it into six, so our double ups from the top six are you know Hawthorne, Frio, and Sydney, so the, the toughest three teams we can play. Um, the Crows, which is always fifty fifty, and the Bulldogs were supposed to be our easy kill double up, um, finishing in the bottom six last year. So we play them twice, and they're they're you know basically the form side of the competition, you know, smashing the Crows, then knocking off Sydney in Sydney. Um, so our, our one easy double up in our really tough draw has now become a very hard double up. So it's, we're going to have to work hard to finish higher this year. But I love watching him play, but I wish we didn't have to play him twice the way they're playing. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, they might tire out as the season goes on. Oh, I you hope know, they do. Young, yeah. young bodies. I mean, they're exciting to watch, though, aren't yeah. they? Oh, yeah, and look, they might take a few more wins off of the good teams like they have with Sydney and, and make it a bit easier for us, but uh, we're, you know, we're going to have to work hard to beat them the way they're playing. Very impressive football side at the moment. Indeed. And what's the, uh, what's the saying? If you're going to be the best, you're going to beat the best. So That's right. If they're one of the better teams, well, when, then we have to knock them off. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. Bring it. Yeah? Bring it on. Bring it on. It does, it does remind me of another hate though, which I, I might change my hate. Do you want me to go next, Macca? Oh, if you want. Yep. All right, I'm gonna, I'll go next. And I'm going to actually change my hate because I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go outside Port Adelaide. I'm going to go with the sniper with Mitchell and also uh, and a little bit of a snipe from Lewis. I thought, especially, uh, especially sorry, Hodge. Um, I thought Hodge's uh, display on um, Swallow was disgraceful and uh, and it should go straight to the tribunal and yeah, it's an indictment on on his career. I mean, he's been such a great player. He doesn't need to do that sort of stuff. And and I think Hawthorne is uh, starting to take it a little bit too far. I don't know how you guys uh, found the whole sequence of events over the last two weeks. Oh, look, I think the Lewis one was a little bit soft. I mean, he didn't connect, and two weeks is probably fine for that. I think people calling for sort of four or five weeks for what Lewis did was, is a bit over the top. But, I mean, the, the Hodge one was just... Bizarre. I mean, you just got to wonder what was going through his head at the time. And I think he probably thought he'd sort of elbow swallow in the chest, but just completely misjudged what he was doing and just clocked him right in the face. And I mean, he's going to have a lengthy spell on the sidelines, you'd think. Yeah, look, I'd imagine so. Yeah, um, I mean, Hawthorne have kind of prided themselves on their unsociable football and, you know, uh, it's always very frustrating to play them and their players go down like they've been shot after the slightest contact, but they're, they're quite happy to, uh, to you know, push other players around and, and that sort of thing. And, and they all seem to get protection from the, umpire, from the umpires and the tribunal. So it's been quite frustrating, but, you know... In, in general, with that sort of thing, you can either be the kind of side that whinges about rough play or you can be the kind of side that monsters other teams physically. But I think this has definitely crossed the line. Um, I think Hodge would be really embarrassed watching that back. Um, it definitely probably taints a bit of his tough guy legacy because, you know, you've got a bit of a fine line between being tough and being a sniper anyway. And, and when you're elbowing guys in the face in that kind of circumstance, it's a really terrible look. So mm. I hope he's embarrassed. Oh, I think, no, it, I think it will be. Yeah. There wasn't anything tough about it, and 
Hopefully, uh, if they he try they try those sort of antic, antics when they uh, come up again against us again that uh, our boys really take it to them, and I, I would imagine they would be. Yep. And uh, I guess my love for the weekend is going to be winning three in a row. Uh, I was uh, getting a little bit uh, caught up in the emotion of our Norton two performance, and I was thinking, oh my god, is the season derailing? And I. I don't think we're uh, firing on all cylinders just yet, but we are definitely starting to chug along a lot better than than what we were in the first two games. So uh, I'm loving the fact that we're three and two. We're what, equal fourth on the ladder now. So um, and the, the the draw really opens up for us. We should be known as the Mister Sunday Night for for the next five weeks, <laughs> shouldn't we? Well, I think it's a pretty good Absolutely. position to be in three and two and. Yeah, it's probably as good as we could have expected, I guess, but um, I'll talk about that in a little bit longer. Yeah. yeah. I look, I, it feels I, like we've I, gone through a bit yeah. of a final series already. It's weird. We yeah, have. It'd be nice to have the easy run out. Well, relatively easy run after this. Uh, I, I mean, I, I always wanting more, but I can't just. I can't help but think if we just gotten over the line against Frio, where we probably should have, and we just lost our nerve a bit at the end. Um, you know, if we just hung on uh, in that game, how well we'd be sitting. But mm. most, I think, most of Big Footy were saying if we could be three and two after this run of five games, we'll be happy, and and we are. So that's a really good result from where we were. It was a very tough run of games. Pro- probably the t- the first four games would be. Four of the toughest games in a row uh, outside of the finals that any any club has played in memory. I think that was yep. you know uh, four, four the other the other top four out of the top five basically. So yeah, yeah really. Oh, you, you can't get harder than that. <laughs> and um, then facing up against the Crows in a showdown. I mean, it's yeah, yeah. Oh, we what delivered, you, so it's good. Uh, look, my love. Uh, well, look before I get started, I've got to say uh, a big. Thanks to Bevan, who tweeted, um, yep, I cleaned the house while the TV was on in the background. It was too stressful, plus the kids uh, learn some new words if I'm watching. So thanks for the backup there. That's great. Um, And look, my love this week, it's got to be the way that we absorbed all the pressure during that second and third quarter. And uh, and the fact that we were still able to win the game. A number of times the Crows tested us and, and tested us pretty strongly. And, you know, they gained the momentum, kicked a couple of goals in a row, but... We just seem to be able to, to switch on at important times. Every single time, they look like taking uh, control of the game. And look, the back line did a wonderful job as well. And secondly, Kane Mitchell, I think I'm in love. I love this guy. He's fantastic. Yeah, really? look, oh, I, I tend to agree. He's just come in and, and started to do his job. I think last year he, uh, he tried to do a bit too much with the ball, maybe thinking he was still playing Waffle or whatever it was. But he would, he'd seem to run and just not really have any idea what to do with it and then cough it up. Whereas this year, he's... He's playing within himself, which is what you want from someone with limited disposal. Uh, he's using his run really well. He's making good decisions. Uh, his physical, the physical side of his game's really stepped up. He's not uh, not bouncing off tackles and, and that sort of thing anymore. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I didn't want him in the side when he got picked. But how can you argue with that? He's just come in and, and taken his shots with both hands and done a really good job for us. Yeah. He's going to make it hard for the guys coming back in to get back in. Absolutely. In three of the hardest games you can play against, I mean, what, North Melbourne away, Hawthorne at home and, and the Crows, and he's just delivered, completely delivered. And, you know, he, he looks a completely different player from last year, and I guess it just goes to show um, how important confidence is. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I Maybe I saw a bit of a different Kane. I, I love his endeavour and his work rate, but he, uh, he's, he's got a bit of the 2012... Jasper Pittard about him and he burns a lot of the ball and his decision making ain't great and um, I, but unfortunately for him he's a little bit older than Jasper is at the respective uh, skill set of time and their performance so um, yeah look I could I could see he's probably going to make way for for Rolly Wines and uh, but you know he's doing his job at this point in time. Yeah, that's right. If, if he can come in when I, I don't think he's best twenty two. I think Wines coming back in for him is is pretty obvious, but. Uh, having having that kind of guy as a as a first drop midfielder who's coming and doing a job, I'm I'm really happy with him. So, mm. full credit to him. Maybe the extra uh, preseason under under Burgess has helped his uh, his physicality a little bit. And um, but I'm full credit to him. I think he's going really well. Yep. So that's it. Look, my hate uh, is a two parter as well. A the fact that I wasn't there, hated it. I hate missing out on showdown wins. And B, the fact that we lost to Frio in round one, as we've just spoken about. Um, it's awesome to be three and two after these five games, but how good would have four and one been? That would have been even better. 
Yeah, we, that was disappointing, especially given our, our last quarters are supposed to be our strength. And we just, you know, I think blinked a little bit and free are the kind of team, especially at Subi, that really punish you. So uh, it would have been really nice to hang on in that game because we definitely had opportunities to win it and uh, we just fell away. So obviously the Sydney game was terrible. Uh, there was no real excusing that. But Frio, we probably should have gotten over the line and we'd be in a really good position if we did. Yeah. All right. So who's going to jump in and uh, do the review tonight? Macca or Scorcho? I'll leave it to Macca to start with and I'll, I'll join in. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> go, Macca. No worries. Well, it was, uh, what was it? Showdown 38, I think it was. Uh, it was a pretty happy one for Port. We won by 24 points in the end, 18 goals, 7 to 13, 13. Um, Schultz once again with a big bag of goals up forward with five. Ryder kick three, um, Hartlett, Mitchell, Westhoff, and we go kick two each. And look, it started off pretty slowly for Port. I mean, we were a bit under the pump in the first sort of five minutes. The Crows got a couple of uh, quick goals, but then we really hit back and um, and got our game going. And I thought we dominated through the middle and we just found so much space up forward, um, just like the corresponding match last year. Um, we just found so much space up forward. We found a lot of pace, and, and we're just kicking goals. I think we kicked seven goals in a row. And then the Crows got back into it. And just like last week, um, in the last quarter, this time it was the second quarter, where we just couldn't get the ball out of our defensive 50. Um, you know, No matter how hard we tried, the ball just kept you know, getting pumped back in. And just like last week, I, I think we held off um, pretty well for as, as long as we could. And you know, the Crows certainly didn't take their chances of, uh, of trying to um, whittle away our lead. After half time, I guess it was the same story through the third quarter. You know, we took our chances when they came along. The Crows had probably the better run of the play. Um, in the last quarter, I thought we, we controlled the play pretty well. Um, and we were just, as I said in my love, you know, we were just able to uh, to go that extra step whenever we, we needed to. It, it looked like we didn't actually go out of second gear for a lot of the game. But, you know, whenever the Crows sort of got close, we were able just to, you know, go up that little bit extra and, and kick a few goals. Well, our midfield yeah. dominated in the beginning, didn't they? They did. That first sort of 40, 45 minutes, they were well on top. They, yeah. yeah. Even Loby in the ruck over Jacobs and uh, you know, Hartlett um, with a cameo with Wines and White. Um, White and Young, my apologies. And then our three prime midfielders, I thought they really dominated. But I thought we lost our midfield in the second quarter, Macker. Is that how, when El Scorcho, is that how you guys saw it? Uh, look, I, I mean, I think overall we were we were on top. I mean, even in that, that second quarter, it, it probably only really hurt when they had us pinned inside their forward 50. And, you know, we were talking about a bit on, on the on the big footy, uh, on, the, on the board about it, that I think there's inside 50s and then there's inside 50s. And I think uh, a lot of our inside 50s, you know, people were saying how efficient we were being, but we were just finding space. We were hitting targets. We were, um, you know, the, the kicker was not as precious as he should have been going inside 50. We were able to work the ball up the field really well. The Crows were pumping it back in uh, in that second quarter and pinning us in there, but... It wasn't a lot of really good quality uh, inside 50s. We had players back. We were, you know, getting the ball out well, and, and they were doing well to get it back in. But we just, um, we just seemed to to have answers for them at every time. And when we, you know, waltzed down the field with our, our superior run and class, they didn't have a lot of answers for us. So I mean, it's a credit to our our defence who have been brilliant all year, but really good in this game. So yeah, that was absolutely fantastic. I thought. Um, no, you're right. I do yeah. agree with that. Yeah, I mean, you just got to look at the difference between when Dangerfield has a clearance and when Robbie Gray has a clearance and where the ball goes and who it ends up with. Absolutely, and that's exactly the same thing. I think I said on the on the forum that you, you almost need two stats for clearances. You need those ones that are just land on the boot and go, you know, 50 metres up into the air and 25 metres forward, and that's that gets the same one clearance as Robbie Gray waltzing it past four other midfielders and hitting Schultz on the chest does. So, you know, uh, and I think having guys like Boak and Gray in our team and Wingard's another one, uh, we get a lot more of that really good quality clearance. So, um, and, and with our halfbacks, you don't really mind the Crows, you know, uh, bombing it up in the air 25 metres forward because we're probably going to win the ball. We're probably going to kick it back over their heads. So, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, we can't look at it that simplistically, though, and I think Ken Hinckley's come out in the, in the press and, and in his presser and uh, said it's not sustainable Alipati's come out and uh, said the same thing. It's not sustainable. And look, we can't keep bleeding 70-plus inside 50s a game as far as I'm concerned because, you know, your you super teams like Sydney, which have got your, your massive two key forwards, they're going to work it out. 
and uh, they're going to dominate. I mean, at the end of the day, that's the domination of your, your inside uh, defensive 50, and it's going to work against you. So to me, I would really like to see that improved, and it doesn't, you know, because all it takes is a couple of jammy marks from them, uh, one of their forwards or midfielders inside that area, you know, even though we've got 15 people in there, and, uh, and bang. Uh, you know, there's a couple of goals and then the, the game becomes a lot closer. So uh, I can see why we potentially are doing it and maybe it's just a clash of game styles and it's just been accentuated last week and this week. But, um, you know, it's something that I think we should probably watch really carefully over the next coming weeks, especially against easier opposition, um, to see how it continues on. Yeah. And I, I think Ken knows that. In his presser after the game, he was pressed on that a little bit and I think he ended up saying, you know, last year we were just about number one in terms of the amount of inside 50s that we gave up, and this year we've, you know, we're miles off it, absolutely miles off it. So I think he understands that we've still got a lot of improvement left in us, which is pretty good. You know, we're we're winning games against good opposition and, you know, certainly nowhere near our best at this point in time. Yeah, I I think our our kind of counter-attacking style means that we we probably get away with it a bit better than other teams do. If they they want to press into their forward line, we've got guys who are really clean with their hands, uh, make good decisions coming out. And as soon as we get out over the top, you have Ebert, who's... You know, 20 metres away from his man taking a good mark. Then you've got Kay Mitchell or Bat White, another another 20 metres over the top. And our run's just too good. So, you know, teams teams will get it in there. But, I mean, if there's any team that has the right game style to counteract uh, conceding a lot of inside 50s, it's us because we can punish teams so badly on on the on the counterattack and on the break. So it's, it's something we definitely need to fix. But I think, you know, it's, it's, it's good to know that we can concede so many uh, and have that sort of differential and still still be comfortably in front. That's it. And how well did our backline handle that pressure? I mean, Carlisle was an absolute monster back there. And, you know, Jasper Pittard again, I mean, I'm almost getting sick of praising him at the moment. I mean, he just <laughs> he just marked everything in sight and just gave us great drive from the defensive 50. And, you know, Cracker did a fantastic job on Charlie Cameron. And, you know, it was only really Jonas on uh, Betts, which was a uh, unfavorable matchup. But I said during my review that sometimes you've got to have one matchup which is unfavourable if all the other ones are going in your favour, sometimes there's always going to be one which you almost have to sacrifice, I guess. Yeah, look, yeah. I don't think I don't think too many defenders in the league can hold bets. Uh, if the ball hits the ground in front of him, he's just so agile and he, he just knows where the goals are and he's quite hard to, to deal with. So if you're keeping him to a, you know, how many did he kick? He only kicked... Um, well, oh, he kicked, he kicked five. five goals. Uh, so, so I mean, he's, he's getting <laughs> the top of it. But he's if you're only keep, keeping him to five goals. <laughs> but at, at the same time, as, as Mackin said, if, you, if he's kicking five, but none of their other forwards are having an impact at all, and they didn't, I mean, Walker kicked two, but you, you'd want a lot more than that. And then their other, their other forwards pretty much did nothing and just were well beaten. Um, you know, he's quite, um, I, I guess MP going forward is our, is the guy we want to be matching up on bets, but I don't think we have a good matchup for him when the ball hits the ground in front of him. Uh, in the air, we should be beating him, but, um, he's just too good when the ball hits the ground. He's too agile. He knows where the goals are. He's too yeah, clever. We didn't beat him the I mean, we either. had, we had Cracker and Pittard who could have gone on him, but I mean, Cracker was killing Cameron and Pittard was, you know, close to best on ground once again. So yeah, that's right. You know, if you've got mm. those two going in your favor, you, Tender don't really want to, you know, change the other one around a little bit. And look, Betts was kicking them out of his behind as well. I mean, that one yeah. from the boundary, I mean, he just slots them a lot. And then he did these two fantastic sort of spin out of tackles and, you know, snap goals. And I mean, you know, sometimes they come off and sometimes they don't. Yeah. I use right. the analogy. We, I think we lost the battle to win the war. And I think you're both right. I think, I think the boys in the coach's box almost were happy um, just to lose that the match up with Eddie Betts, knowing that he isn't going to kick the the match winning score uh, because all the other players were beating their opponents. Um, yeah. So I can see it, but it's still uh, it was sort of frustrating because uh, as I mess message Macca during the game, it was you could just see it early that he was dominating Jonas, and I'm surprised they didn't try something different. But uh, that's the way it played out, and uh, so be it. I guess it ended up being winners of grinners. That's, That's right. Look, we've had a couple of tweets um, from Bevan and also Nicholas Teal saying their hate, which is the Crows covering our race. Um, what did you think of that? I personally didn't see it as that much of a problem. Well, this uh, has look, come up before, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it says a lot more about them than it does about us. 
uh, I think that's it. You know, if, if that's something they want to do, good luck to them. Uh, they're a very classy organization, as everyone knows. Um, you know, we, uh, yeah, we, we have a, we have a race named after an SANFL legend. He's a port legend, but he's an SANFL legend. Uh, their race is not named after Bob Hammond. So, you know, I, if that's what they want to do, that's up to them. That's, you know, yeah, I, I, well, I think this, it paints I, them in a pretty bad light. Look, I don't know the full details, Macca and El Scorcho, but one thing I do know, um, it seems a bit hypocritical from me from an SANFL point of view because, yeah, the, the Crows represent the SANFL, which also means they represent a period of time when the Port Adelaide Magpies were in the SANFL. And um, so why are they trying to cover up their heritage? I, that's what I don't get. Um, I think from yeah, memory... It was, yeah. Sorry, Rick. I think from memory, the reason why they did it was that they didn't want Crow supporters having to look at Port paraphernalia in our race whilst a Crow's game was on. I think that was the main reason behind it. Well, right. you know, if they're, if they're that worried Which about us... Which is pretty petty, but... Yeah, look, if, if they're that worried about in the end, us... Look, then I think we do be... the same thing. I think we cover their race when Port games are on. Oh, they, I, I don't think... I don't really see a need for it. It's... You know, we, we know it, it's both teams' stadium, and if that's what they want to do, that's fine. I don't think we should be doing it either. Mm. I don't think there's a, a really big need for it. Um, you know, it's it, it, it seems like it's an active, you know, we have to worry about what they're doing, and I don't think it's something we need to worry about. I think just, just let it go. Yeah. Yeah. I think we need to uh, to move on, I guess. Maybe it's feeding the troll, so to speak. Ah, uh, yeah. So, well, there's a couple of moments in the game, and... I wanted to bring out because I get frustrated as a supporter. Um, and one of them was poor old Aaron Young getting tackled and the tackles slip and trips him and he gets nailed holding the ball. Now, near every Port Adelaide tackle that I see that that happens, it gets called a trip. And then on that occasion, it's holding the ball. Am I the only one that's frustrated here? I, De- depends I, yeah, when the trip happens. Yeah. Depends how long he's been tackled for before it slips down and he's tripped. I, I am frustrated, oh. but I, I think he needed to play to the whistle a little bit more. I mean, he had both arms free. Just get a handball away, and then if they call the trip, they call the trip. Um, you, you've got to play to the whistle a little bit more. And I, I thought it was definitely a trip, but at the same time, um, he he stood there with, with you know, the, the cross player around his legs, you know, standing there with, with both arms free, ready to handball. And if, if he's not calling the trip, then he, then he can only be holding the ball. If he gets a handball away, he's a chance of getting the trip call, but he's not going to get holding the ball. So I think it was just a bit of a mistake from him, but I definitely agree that it should have been a trip. It was pretty clear to me. Mm. Well, I'd love to hear if people listening in think it's a trip or, uh, or holding the ball. I'm sure everyone's going to say trip, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that, it just hurt me because it just, re- it just reminds me of every slip tackle, especially away from home that we do, and it's trip. Free kick, result, goal, anyway. but, but uh, And what about um, Lobie and Ryder smashing Sam Jacobs and Josh Jenkins? That went according to plan. It did. I mean, the Crows midfield still won the clearance stat, but in the end, that didn't really matter. I thought, um, you know, Lobie has been pretty much thumped by Jacobs three or four times in the past. So for him to get one back, I think is uh, is going to do a world of good for his confidence going into the next showdown. And look, to have Ryder there as well, I thought he did uh, he did a, a wonderful job in the ruck um, with his sort of cameo up there as well. Yeah, I tend to agree. I, I think it was really good for, for Loby, especially, you know, coming back for a few weeks off. Um, I think last week was a bit of a, you know, like a first game back for him. So for him to come out and get 38 hit outs uh, against one of the competitions, Premier Ruckman, really, uh, going over the past you know, 12 to 18 months. Uh, that was a really good performance. And having those two in the Ruck division, who are both probably top five or six Ruckman over the last couple of years, is really positive going forward. If they can start to really dominate, uh, it makes us very dangerous because uh, you can't really stop us when we're getting clearances. Yeah. Uh, we, go, we go into that kind of God mode like we did against Hawthorne where we just go goal after goal after goal. Um, if they can start really getting on top of their hit outs to advantage and we can dominate a few teams, um, we, yeah, we'll end up with a pretty good percentage. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, though. <laughs> no, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the key there. And <laughs> I said something a little bit controversial today. 
and uh, on Big Footy, and Zorro too even wanted to mock me, and he must have realised that I was a mod and compared him, so he deleted his post before I saw it. But <laughs> I can still see it anyway, mate. I know what you what you did, and I'm not impressed. But um, <laughs> I'm going to hunt you down. No, I'm only joking. Um, I'm say, I made the comment to REH that. This inside 50 efficiency comment reminds me a lot of Choco's reign. It doesn't matter about the inside 50s. We're really efficient. The only difference is we're winning. When Choco was saying it, we were losing. Well, Choco yes. used to like us to kick it inside 50 and get a you know a throw in from the you know to the pocket, get a throw in, and then basically hustle it home from there. We, my mates and I, who who I sit with, used to joke about how. Uh, Choco loved his hustle goals. He didn't want us to kick nice, clean, you know, leading mark goals. He wanted us to get it in there and basically scrap it out to a to a snap and then snap it through. And that was that seemed to be his favourite kind of goal based on the way we played because we definitely didn't kind of try and score any other goal. It was just uh, just hustle goals. So my uh, the mates that I sit with will appreciate that call. I think. Um, yeah, it was very infuriating to watch. We were a lot cleaner entering the fifty under Hinkley. Definitely. Long live the days when Brett Ebert was leading into Rosette. In the grandstand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those were the days. And then you had uh, Motlop leading into Rose, but that's where you wanted him kicking him from. That's where that's he was going to nail it. So. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good work. So, Maka, who was your um, who was your top five? I haven't written them down, so I can't really remember. But look, uh, top five off the off the top of my head, I think I had uh, Robbie Gray up there. He was brilliant, absolutely brilliant yet again. And look. Um, it's great to see him playing as a pure midfielder, as he has all this year. It was great to see him kick a goal for the first time this year as well. Um, but look, he's doing magical things in the middle. I thought Bokey played a brilliant game as well. Um, I, I called for him to sort of stand up during that third quarter, and, and he did, him and uh, a few others, um, which is great to see. I thought he had a bit of a slow first half, but his uh, second half was as good as anybody's on the field. Um, look, Brad Ebert, just the, the consummate professional, just runs all day. Um, had a monster first half to get us going. And, you know, he was arguably the most valuable player on the pitch, I thought. Um, you know, Kane Mitchell, I thought, was very, very good. Um, Jay Schultz, with five goals up forward, was just a monster. Um, and look, Bobby Carlisle, big shout-out to him because he's just in almost career-best form at the moment. Yeah, look, absolutely. He's, he's, uh, he's beating gun forwards every week uh, and it's you know he's doing it one on one he's doing it as a part of a team defense but uh, he, he's going to keep beating forwards and eventually other you know uh, you know the Victorian media is going to notice and uh, he, he's just doing it every week he's, he's been absolutely brilliant what about his uh, first quarter run down the wing with the link up play how fantastic oh, was the that? one twos that was yeah. brilliant very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it was great was, yeah very good to see that's that's exactly what you want from him I mean uh, it's good to know that our I think I think we had a few issues kicking out of defence. I think Trengove scuffed a few kicks, but um, but it's good to know that in general our our backs can defend, but they can also when when required of them, uh, run and carry the ball and link up with the, the the midfielders and and have an impact going forward. And that's probably why we're such a good good team on the counter attack. Yeah, it was yeah. basically a case of everyone played well. I mean, even the guys that I would say were arguably our worst players on the day. You know, looking at Jonas and. I don't know, maybe Monfries as well. I mean, they still had pretty good games. Jonas had some absolute huge spoils at really crucial times in that second half. And, I mean, Monfries shut out Brody Smith, who's, you know, one of the Crows' most dangerous players. And Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's really hard to find someone that didn't perform their role on the day. I'm actually shocked when I saw the stats and Monfries had 16 possessions because uh, I thought he didn't get near the ball. And... Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, that was really. Yeah, surprising. I would have thought he had seven or eight. I after think the game. Uh, I think he let, I think he let up the ground a bit. I think he had a little link work in the back half when we were getting out. You know, we were getting out. I think that's probably where I noticed him the most. Was um, you know, I'd love to see a heat map of or, or where he got his disposals, but um, I think he he was playing lead up like right up the ground into the almost into the defensive fifty to take some marks. So I think you find if you watch the first half again, he, that's where he got a lot of his touches. Uh, doing that sort of play, so but shutting out Brody Smith, I, I don't care if he doesn't get a touch if he shuts out one of their best yeah. playmakers. So That's great it, effort yeah. from him Absolutely. again. And I, I think people keep calling for him to be dropped, but uh, he's playing a no. role and his and his ceiling when he if, if he does really turn it on, he's capable of doing what he did on the weekend, plus kicking three or four goals. So uh, I think he's too valuable to to be leaving out at any stage. I think we just play him into form. Yeah. 
Yeah. Any tweets out there, Maka? Oh, let me have a look. Were you guys concerned when Adelaide slotted uh, three quick goals in the third to close within a kick? Did you get a sense that it was playing out as the second showdown last year played out? Uh, a little bit, but you always felt like we, we had a bit too much class. I mean, in the in the second showdown, we'd obviously obviously lost Trengove, and that really hurt our ability to cut them off. But, um, I, I mean, I think I think a, we're a couple of those goals, bets, and, you, I mean, you, as I said earlier, you can't really stop bets. If, he wants, if the ball's around him and he wants to kick one, he's going to kick one. Um, so, look, overall, you felt like we were going to be able to steady and, and class over them as we had basically all game. So, and that's what ended up happening. So it, it was a bit concerning. Uh, the crowd almost almost raised a whimper for, for a second there when they got three in a row. Um, so mm. they almost got the crowd <laughs> in the game, but not quite. So, But, no, it was really good to, to see us kick a couple of steadiers and, and, um, and get back in control of the game. And that's, that's what we need to do, and we'll be tested by good teams all year. So we just need to make sure we can uh, – can concede a few in a, in a row and not go into the old style where we just get dominated for a quarter and, and concede eight goals. So, yeah, it was, it was really good to come back from that. That's it. Well, that was the thing. We did get dominated for a quarter, but we didn't concede eight goals. Mm. Um, but we were dominated. That second quarter, they annihilated us. And talking about Brody Smith, he, he was probably one of their key drivers in that second quarter. He was providing a lot of run, a lot of uh, inside 50 delivery and... Uh, uh, just couldn't spot it up. Dangerfield yeah. was another one. I think he was tracking at about 29% disposal efficiency delivering the ball Career inside average. 50. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> um, look, look, Danger was guys, really good, yeah. but I, I really enjoyed Dangerfield's game, but, God, you just wish he could kick properly. Uh, if he could, he'd he be just, uh, he needs to, the best teams of the league. So, he needs to slow down and pace just before he kicks. I think he just, he just goes 100 miles and just doesn't give you... Give himself any steady time. If it was that simple, um, to... he would have done that by now, I reckon. Because that's been the criticism yeah. of him for years now, is that he just doesn't slow down. And I, I tend to agree, I don't think he does slow down. He just bangs it on the boot and it goes any which way. And sometimes it comes off. I think um, one of the Crows' first goals was an absolute mongrel punt by Dangerfield, which just somehow landed in the, the lap of someone and, and they kicked, I think, the first goal of the game. But... Mm. But then, you know, he, he slots goals from all sorts of angles when he plays up forward. So, I don't know. Yeah, I think yeah, it's I, probably more mental with him. I think uh, just back to back to their dominance in the second quarter, um, I think at one point I said to the guys I was standing with, um, we almost needed to concede a goal just so we could get it back yeah, to the centre. Right. Um, and, and that worked for us. I don't think, uh, you know, I think if you look at the, the – they did dominate us, but the score was pretty even. And they just weren't um, – they weren't, they weren't taking advantage. But then when they did and we got a centre bounce, we'd get a clearance and we'd kick a goal. So they'd work so hard for, for their goal. And then we'd go down and just waltz through and kick an easy one. And, and I think that's probably a good thing to do for us. If we, I mean, with guys like Gray, we're always going to be a danger in the clearances. If we can just keep that kind of scoreboard pressure up when, when a team's a bit all over us, uh, that's going to be really good. So, you know, they, they, they spent a lot of time up there, but we answered every time in that, uh, in that second. So... And I, th- I think that was really important, and you would hope we can continue to yep. do that when in that sort of ga- uh, time of a game. Got a few tweets here, Alex. Alex. Yep. Yeah, I was going to say Alex has just tweeted in about the subbing of Jacko. You think that was the right call? I think so. I think. Um, I mean, it could have possibly played against us because they still had you know the three tolls up there. But in the end, I thought it was a good move and, and gave us some extra run when we needed it. And look, Jenkins oh, look, was I think Jenkins he, is hopeless, yeah. and he's <laughs> he was never going to win them the game. So, I think uh, our flexibility, the extra flexibility, the extra tall brings us. And I, I talked about this obviously last year a lot uh, when when campaigning to have Butcher selected. Bringing the extra tall means we can throw Westhoff back. We can, you know, Lobie can always play, uh, you know, filling up a hole. It gives us a lot more flexibility to do that kind of thing, and we can bring on a running player and and drop off a. Uh, 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 a tall, theoretically slower player, and still have a very formidable uh, tall defense and attack and uh, solid ruck contingent. So, just the, the extra, especially a player that's as mobile as Ryder, having someone, um, you know, having that extra tall gives us a lot more flexibility in that sense. And I think tactically that'll show as the season goes on. And it did, I think, uh, in the last quarter there. That's it. A couple of other yeah. tweets. And, all right. Sorry, sorry Rick. A couple of other yep. tweets. We got Nicholas Till on the uh, Aaron Young tackle. Um, issue. Um, he agrees with El Scorcher that it was borderline and that he should have probably handballed it off. Um, we've also got Bevan um, agreeing with me um, about Ebo that he was uh, in the best players but um, didn't get in the coaching votes. 
Don't mention ours tweet because I'm going to bring that up in one second and it makes me angry. I don't know if you guys have even heard about it. Have the you? J- the James no. H. Chris Scott, Geelong. Hey, yeah. No. Uh, what so was our, tweeted in, ours tweeted in about the article on news.com about Geelong's Chris Scott calling Port Adelaide hip- hypocrites about dancing on Brisbane's grave trying to get James Aish after uh, after what Geelong tried to do to steal Travis Boak. Well, let's face the facts. Um, Geelong were quite arrogant in their approach for Travis Boak a couple of years ago. Um, Travis wasn't a second-year player in the system. He was an established player who went on to become our captain, who they were just trying to swan in and with their superiority complex and think they were entitled to do so. And then uh, I know they later in that season they also tried to target a Gold Coast player and Neil Baum was on the radio going, oh, we would never intentionally contact a player during the season to, uh, <laughs> to try and attract them. We're more respectful than that when it comes to our football clubs and blah, blah, blah. What a load of shit. Sorry, I'm going to yeah. swear. Oh, um, yeah, what a load of shit. Geelong yeah. are the biggest hypocrites going around, not Port Adelaide. I don't I look, think we even bagged Geelong in the media about I, I coming think, uh, over and... Oh, look, I, I think it was it was disgusting enough on its own. People, did, we didn't need to bag them because you know I think the media was. Uh, look, there's there's two. You know, this is one of those things, a bit like the the physical play, where you can either be the kind of team that does it, and you can be the kind of team that goes and poaches players because you're really attractive to play for, or you can be this kind of team that sucks about it. And I think it's really. I mean, I, th- I think Geelong. I don't think we'll have too many Geelong fans listening, so I can say this. I think Geelong have had their fall down the table coming because their 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 you know administrators and, and players and fans have just kind of acted like you know Cameron Guthrie is going to be the next Jimmy Bartel and they're going to you know swan on up you know back up the ladder and be be a super team again. Um, that that kind of comment from from Scott shows that they're now one of the teams that's a bit scared. Yeah. I think they're going to lose players. You know, a player like Motlop might go because he's going to go. Well, do I really want to hang around Geelong being in the bottom eight for most of the rest of my career? And they're not going to want to. So that's a really that's a scared comment from Scott, and that's a very typical Scott brother comment. Uh, you know, it, it shows what they're thinking when they're trying to talk about something else, and and that's a very scared comment. And I hope we poach a couple of Geelong players, and he has a big cry about it yes. <laughs> over the next few years. Well, why doesn't he come out and bag uh, Hawthorne for poaching player after player? I mean, uh, didn't they take O'Rourke at last year's um, trade period off of GWS for pick 20 or something and he was a number yep. two or three pick? Absolutely. You know, what, what, doesn't he, what doesn't he get in there and uh, complain about Hawthorne taking advantage of the, the new franchises in the How system? How long were I they mean, tapping up? Well, I don't, uh, oh, exactly. And, and that's exactly what they've done. You know, they've – well, yeah – and that, they've done it as bad as anyone. Who, who else did they got? They got someone else from um, uh, from uh, who was the Melbourne defender who they got? Um, it's name escapes me. But they've Rivers. done it as bad as anyone. Yeah, Rivers. It, Rivers, that's the one. And it, look, it's it's your responsibility as a team at the top. And I expect us to do this. I expect teams to get angry with us because we're poaching their players. Because as a team that's approaching a premiership window, it's your responsibility to poach players. And the rules are the way they are. You may as well use them to your advantage. And the free eight with with free agency, we should be looking to to poach some players and stay at the top for as long as we can. It's it's almost it'd be disappointing if we weren't doing it. To be honest, I agree. Well, with I hope so. We we haven't even been at the top yet, and we All haven't right, well, been up there that, that long. So uh, I'd be hoping we can stay up there for a while if we can uh, eventually get up there. But. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it does make an interesting debate and maybe something we can have in one of the um, uh, buy rounds, but can we actually bring in too many players sort of ready-made, so to speak, from the outside and, and sort of disrupt team harmony? Um, because obviously we've got great team harmony now and you know, if there are, I'll just pick a couple of those examples. Let's say James Aish is keen to come back home and, and is keen to go to port and and like you said, Stephen Motlop's keen to get out of the Geelong system because he doesn't want to be stuck there for five years doing nothing. Um, even though they're great players, will we uh, will we interrupt the harmony of the team unit by bringing in too many that might be wanting to chase the uh, chase the gold? 
Oh, look, that's definitely possible. But, uh, I, I mean, I think like Ryder, you, you assess it on a case-by-case basis. Whether our salary cap will allow that, we you know, we, we may find that we're losing uh, young guys. We'll have guys retire as well. You know, you'd expect over the next five years we'd be losing, you know, Corns this year. Schultz is, is getting on. Westhoff's getting on. You know, those kind of play- – White and Monfries aren't young. And, and that's, I guess, where, where you kind of – you make it up. You're, you're losing an established star, but then if you can bring one straight back in for the same amount of money – um, look, we, we, it'd have to be assessed on a case by case basis. But if they're the right fit, they're the right fit. Ultimately, if if, if a player is missing out on games because he's not quite good enough, like Ben Newton was, and he goes on and has a great career elsewhere, good on him. Um, we need to do whatever it takes to to make sure we're uh, we're still winning, or keeping ourselves as close as we can to winning a flag. Yeah, I think. So I, I'd like yes. us to. I'd like us to always be aggressive in the free agency market while while we're such an attractive side to play for. Um, you know, we have to muck around with contracts and do whatever we have to do. Uh, you know, Hawthorne are doing it. What we need to make sure we're doing it as well. Yeah. Good call. All I've got to say is, suck my rotten egg fart, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> Live radio, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Live radio. I just, I'm not a, I'm not a fan. I am just not a fan. He's a whiner. Uh, he's a Scott brother. He he should be gratefully inherited a premiership side and actually got a, a premiership cup as a coach. You know? It's, it's going it's to be really uh, enjoyable watching him fall down the ladder and eventually get yeah. sacked because, yeah, as you say, he, he inherited players that pretty well coached themselves and who coached themselves to a, a flag on the back of already knowing what, what to do and he just kind of was the steward there. So, uh, yeah, he's a sook and I'll enjoy watching them fall down the ladder, absolutely. Yeah. Rick, do you want to do the uh, Who Am I? Oh, Macca, you've read my mind, you mind reader. <laughs> this is the control freak, Jacob, coming into Macca. He can't, can't let go of control. He's got to get his hands back into it. Yeah, but I think that's a good, a good idea. No, what? someone's already trying to call me. Bloody hell. No, Nicholas, we've spoken about the prize. You can't enter. I'm sorry. You're, uh, you're banned. So um, the clue is I want a trophy. There you go. So, born in 66, he's won a trophy. Yes. He's kicked between two yes. and four million goals, as you said. Yes. And he follows Richo. Correct. Yeah. Boys, you're supposed to be shooting the breeze while I'm trying to get this working. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess, uh, what did we th- I mean, I, th- I thought maybe Young had a bit of a quiet game in the showdown. I was going to talk about that earlier, but it, the, the topic changed. He, uh, I mean, he played his role, and I guess he can't be up every week. But I thought I would have liked to, to get for him to get a little bit more involved, especially with us losing the clearances. Mm. I've been a big young fan, so I'm hoping he. Can, I don't think he, he definitely won't lose his spot because I think he's he's pretty much kept it yeah. now. But I hope he bounces back a little bit next week against maybe a bit of a weaker midfield because uh, with uh, with Dangerfield's big body in there, we know we know what Young is capable of. So I hope he's a bit better next week. I, he was probably probably. I mean. He wasn't bad, but he was probably the least impressive, I, I felt. And I've been a, a big fan of his. I had him, so, on, the verge I don't know the, I had him on the verge of the best players, not too far behind. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. I'll Simply because every time he went All near right. it, something really good happened. But I do agree that he was pretty quiet and, I don't know, he, he just needs to find a way to get up to that sort of 20 to 25 disposal mark, whereas at the moment he's yeah. kind of between that sort of 10 to 17, I guess. If he could find a way to get yeah. some outside ball, that would be wonderful. But his inside work, yeah. I thought, was really important on the weekend. I think uh, I think we used to say he used to be the super sub because he'd get the same amount of possessions when he was coming on as a sub last year as he would yeah, in a full game. Um, and and that's I mean he's obviously taken some big steps in this this season and really kind of solidified himself as a best twenty two player in my opinion. Uh, but obviously there's some teething issues with that. Uh, I definitely don't want him dropped from the side, and I think he's I think he's had a fantastic year. So I was just trying to fill up some air space, but yeah. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd hope I'd hope he, I'd hope he can bounce back and uh, and and do a bit better. Yeah, As you say, stop we, talking now. Okay, all right, okay. I've, I've got right. it. I've got the guess. I can't add him. Sorry, Alex. I apologise. I can't add you without blocking the call. Um, but he's guessed Ken Hinckley. Oh. Macca. Is he correct? You know the answer. That would be no. No, he is not Ba-bow. correct. Ah. So who have we had on the list? Ken We've Hinckley, Roger, Roger the Dodger, Dodger Tim Genever. And Rowan Smith. And Rowan Smith. And Big Al has called me an absolute disgrace. This is true. This is why this <laughs> this is why I run it, Rick. 
<laughs> hey, it was going well until that point. Hey, I heard some rumors. I heard some rumours, Macca, that uh, Jacob took some notes from the uh, the Magpies game. I believe game. he did. Oh. Well, I think it's time for a bit of an <laughs> SANFL review by El Scorcho Surgeon. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, obviously, uh, disappointing loss in the end. Um, we went down by. Let's just get this up. It was only only a couple, a few kicks in the end, like, uh, seventeen points. Um, but ultimately, it was a, t- a tale of two halves for us. Uh, the first quarter, we started the right. Um, let me just get these notes up. Uh, we we were struggling a, li- a little bit with our forward entry, and a, you know there was some pressure from um, from uh, the Eagles. But overall, even when we had a clean kick, we just seemed to to scuff it, and we te- we seemed to generate our our good forward entries from our, our lead up forwards like Butcher uh, coming and getting the ball. Uh, but overall, uh, there were some really good signs early. I thought in the first half, uh, probably the story for me was uh, Redden hitting the ball down to Archie. I thought that was almost Primus Franco. They just seemed to find each other uh, every time. Uh, and and that, um, that, uh, that, kind of, that clearance work really opened the game up for us, and we were looking really good. Uh, in the second, second quarter, our, our ball movement improved again. Um, Need Need was probably uh, our best on ground. I felt he's just too too clean. He burned the ball a little bit, but you could see the class he has and just the extra time he seems to have with the ball, uh, very smooth. Um, I thought Butcher was presenting well. I thought Aust- uh, Logan Austin was probably it was the first time I I'd, I'd, uh, I'd seen him alive apart from the uh, the uh, the monsoon at, uh, at uh, Adelaide Oval against Nord, and he just just moves well, reads the play well, nice disposal. I think he'll fit really well into our back half uh, when he gets the chance. Um, and and Tom Logan also was was playing really well. So uh, probably this the second half was a, a very different game. Uh, we we started to get beaten in the middle, and. Um, uh, Wither West Torrens cleaned up a lot of it and, and sorted out their forward entries. I think what I noticed is that they were playing loose defenders and we didn't seem to be. Um, every time they would go forward with a quick break, it was all one-on-ones. Uh, every time they'd win a clearance, we were all one-on-one. It probably allowed them to get too much, uh, too many easy balls into the forward line. And, um, and yeah, I, I thought we should have been playing a loose back. There's obviously a reason we're not doing it um, for development or whatever, but I think that probably cost us the game in the end. Um, uh yeah, so our forward entry didn't really improve. We were still struggling to get the ball in, even with uh, clean entries. Um, it was a shame to see our, our defence probably didn't tra- – our defence at the AFL level, uh, our amazingly solid back six didn't really translate down, unfortunately. But we weren't playing that loose player. So disappointing second half, but there were still some good signs from some of our players. Um, uh, Need was probably my favourite player of the game. And uh, Logan Austin was really positive to see him playing well as well. I think he'll be a player for us. So, Good review, I think. Yeah. It, it just seems yeah. like we were just kicking it backwards and forwards and not really doing much. I mean, a lot of people have called it one of the worst games they've ever seen in, in their lives or one of the most boring. And I mean, I think in the first quarter we had 95 disposals for five inside 50s, which is just, I mean, nowhere near as efficient as you should be. And I mean, in the end, when you have 350-odd um, disposals and 120 marks and you only kick six goals, you, you've got to question what's going on a bit. Yeah, definitely. I think even a couple of those, most of those five inside fifties were just hacks that were turned straight back over. Um, I think the first, the first time we really looked good, uh, Butcher led out to the um, to, to the wing and was able to kick back over the top for one of our goals. And you know, it's uh, we, we really need to sort that out. Whether we need, I mean, we've got the tall guys up there. Obviously, we got Shaw, Harvey, and Butcher who can all clunk a mark. Uh, we just need to get the ball in quicker. And I don't know whether we're trying, trying to be a bit too cute with it and work it in, but, you know, it works at AFL level where we have the, you know, really silky skills, but, you know, our, probably our skill level at SANFL level isn't, I guess, high enough. And maybe we're trying to play a similar game style at both uh, at, at both levels, but it's a very different game at SANFL level, and I think that that's probably where we hurt ourselves. Is it a bit concerning that our S, our reserve or re, SANFL side isn't playing uh, with the continuity that we'd expect? I mean, some of those players now are, are developed players, three years in the system, and probably uh, uh, should be doing a little bit better. 
Yeah, look, I, I mean, as a bit was made about a, a Paul Stewart's game and uh, and and that, and probably a, a Cleary as well. And I just thought they they got a fair bit of the ball and they took marks and whatever. But they just, as Mac has said, they just seem to be chipping it across half back. They they were getting a lot of touches without actually having a lot of impact. Um, and it was probably disappointing for a guy like Stewart, who you think should be the senior guy on the ground. And he's 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 quite a talented footballer, despite having a bit of an issue not knowing what role he plays. Um, but you'd, you'd want someone like that to be able to stand up and grab the game by the scruff of the neck, and, and no one really seemed to be willing to do that for us. Um, yeah, and, and that was probably the story of the day. We just didn't really seem to have anyone who wanted to stand up and win us the game. Yeah. How'd the arch go? Um, I thought he was brilliant in the first half. Uh, I thought, as, as I, I mentioned in the review, I thought Redmond and him were connecting really well. And you notice that, I, I guess, you know, uh, you notice the difference in having a proper Ruckman. Uh, and I, I really did in the first half. But he probably faded away in the second half and he just didn't notice as much of it, uh, kind of as much of him. Still ended up with 22 touches. Um, but yeah, probably faded away in the second half when he needed to step up. Mm. So. Yeah, I mean, it's still reasonable. Yeah, I'm here. It is. How, how was your love child, Mason Shaw, Macca? Look, I thought he played... Uh, he sort of spent some time in the ruck and then also spent some time in defence and, you know, didn't really spend a whole yep. lot of time up forward. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, he took a couple of really good contested marks across the back half. Um, it would have been nice given we just couldn't... You know, we weren't willing to keep the ball inside 50. Maybe to try him up there a bit more to uh to give us a bit more to kick at but um yeah no look you can tell he's working back from his from his injury and i think he'll improve as he goes on as he did last year but um yeah you know uh, another step forward for him um I, I didn't mind what i saw so yeah what about uh cam o'shea how'd you see his game uh did, it didn't really have a lot of impacts i didn't think just yeah, I, if, it seems to be two different camo shades, doesn't there? There's the the one who turns up at the start of the season and just has very little impact at SNFL level, and then he seems to flick a switch in the middle of the season. Um, and at the moment, he's definitely in uh, the kind of mode where he's not having an impact. And I guess he's he being you know not really being a midfielder, it's, it might be hard for him to work his way into these sort of games. But um, you'd expect a player who has played such good level of football at AFL level to be able to have a bit more of an impact. And probably he's even more disappointing than, than Stewart because he's probably played at a higher level um, uh, at, a, at AFL level and just couldn't impose himself on the game at all. Um, you, you wouldn't have known from looking that he was a, a quite a good AFL player uh, when he's at his best. Disappointing. Awesome. Well, what other games uh, across the Next AFL um, were you interested in this week? It was a bit of a non-event this week. Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, there wasn't too much. Um, probably, you know, the, the the Bulldogs knocking off Sydney was the story. Um, I didn't see too much of it, but, uh, you know, for, for them to lead all day and Sydney to come back and get in front in the last quarter and the Bulldogs to, to fight and hang on was a really uh, was a really good effort for them and a really good story to win away in Sydney. And as I mentioned in my hate, you know, they're, they're looking like they're going to be a really tough side to beat. And, and that's, you know, that's really – they're exciting to watch. Very good young midfield, uh, and that's with Libertore still out. Uh, so, so that was probably the most interesting game for me to see Sydney lose in Sydney against a team that most people would have had out of the eight. Yeah. Uh, it was really impressive. Almost unheard of. I'm going to go. I'm going to go the pathetic insipidness of Richmond. Yeah. God, they're entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually thought they might have kicked on this year. Well, how stupid was I? Um, yeah, they're just yeah. they're just falling into their own. All old traits once again, and uh, looks like they're going to probably fall off the rails. I would imagine. I think uh, I think everyone got a bit too excited about them falling into the eight by fluking nine wins in a row, and they, you know they beat a Sydney team that had their worst game probably for the year, and then they they beat eight other average sides to kind of fall into eighth position, and there was a lot of hype about them. Then we we absolutely wiped them off the park, uh, obviously in that elimination final. I think they're playing more like the team that shouldn't have made the eight than the team that you know, I think Richmond support, supporters would like them to be. The thing about Richmond is that their good players don't stand up and when it counts. You know, you look at our guys like Boke and Gray, who when, when the game's there to be won, they step up and they win the game. Koch and Martin, Delidio, they're not that kind of player. They're, they're kind of, you know, uh, icing players, not cake players. Yeah, that's a great call. 
I yeah. agree with that. Mm-hmm. For me, it was the Q Clash. I called that um, in the preview podcast, and look, I watched it, and it wasn't that great to be <laughs> to be honest. It was a it was a bit of a, a flop, but. Look, it was, it was great to see Gold Coast put it all together uh, for the first time this year. And, you know, to see Charlie Dixon kick six goals and Harley Bennell, uh, best on ground. Josh Glenn's debut um, was, was pretty good as well. So uh, good to see them hit some form, even if it was just against Brisbane. Yeah, that's right. You know, they've got so much talent there and, and maybe there were some teething issues with Ede and, and what he was getting them to do. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, they've definitely got enough talent to, to – they should be beating – Brisbane by that sort of margin if they're serious and maybe there's been some teething issues with Eid as I said but uh, it's it's good to see them put, them, put it all together. Uh, whether they'll make the eight or not I'm not sure. They're, I think they'll probably be up and down all year um, uh, yeah look I think probably from their start of the year uh, Guy McKenna can feel a little bit hard done by it because I think he had them tracking pretty well mm. <laughs> so yeah um, so how many weeks is it now until we're able to actually watch a Friday night game without falling asleep? Is you know What's next week? Is there actually a Collingwood along, so there's another you know bottom bottom ten clash. <laughs> it's it's getting closer, but it's still not quite. I think there, sometime is it? in August is going to be the first uh, proper Friday night game. I think. But... Yeah, look, I mean, we got Essendon North Melbourne in a couple of weeks on the Friday night. That could be good if the right Essendon and the right North Melbourne mm. turn up. Um, but yeah, look, oh, what a disaster playing Carlton. So many, you know, who have just been an insipid, pathetic side. So on so many Friday night games, they they're boring to watch. They lose. Uh, I don't know whether they thought maybe Carlton would be up and about, and maybe it's maybe it's that the AFL knew that Carlton would be shit and thought, you know, what we'll do, we'll play Carlton early when their fans are going to be turning up and and give them their give them their games then, because if we give them Friday night games later in the season, their fans are going to stop caring because they're going to be bottom four. So, but yeah, it's very silly, frustrating, uh, very frustrating kind of uh, scheduling from the uh, from the AFL uh, to not give us a one decent Friday night game in in now six or five rounds. And six next it's week. It's not like they've been good in recent years, Carlton. They've been uh, pretty poor for a long time now. Yeah. All right, lads. Anything else? I reckon that might be it. No worries. Thank right, you so for having me again. Macca. Yeah. yeah, El Scorcho. Jacob, we've got the uh, <laughs> 1870 hour tomorrow night doing round 5 to 11. Um, they might even have a voucher to give away. We've got the Magpie show coming up on Wednesday and we're going to have a double header. Um, seeing we had a bit of a disaster with the software, um, the AFL review show is going to come on Wednesday night and do their show as well. And uh, and then Macca and I will be back on Thursday to preview the massive Mother's Day game, Port v Flat Track Bullies Huge. West Coast. So uh, and and then the Power Pair, of course, doing their great show on Friday night. So uh, there's plenty of entertainment for everyone uh, who wants to get Port content. Yeah, no dramas. And, and now I take offence to your comments that I'm letting the team down in a <laughs> disgrace. I do have feelings, you know. <clears throat> Thanks yeah, for letting right. go of control, <laughs> both there. There you go. Uh, All right, guys, you have a great crazy. night. Thanks for having me. Go here. the Port Adelaide Football Club. Go the pit! Though by Broadbent through the middle of the ground. Now a long kick down in the Paul Stewart direction. He marks and plays on. He keeps his footing. Got away from Farida.